Hey, Life Church family, uh, it's Father's Day weekend, and so uh, I wanted to do a little something different this year. Um, you hear from me every year. Uh, I wanted you to hear from some people that's a part of our church, and because I think we can all relate uh, to the human experience. Well, most of us. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, we just want you to, we're, we're going to invite you in to this discussion, and we're just going to talk about basically the the impact of a father and how important fatherhood really is and so uh, that being said uh, I'll introduce us real quickly I've got uh, to my left Seth Williams his father Mick Williams and uh, they are actually both professors at Tennessee Tech University mm -hmm. and I found out earlier that <laughs> Seth the son is the senior professor and dad you're the I'm more junior. Junior professor. Okay. Do you hold that over his head a little bit? Uh, absolutely. Oh, you absolutely. go for it. <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, we're, we're so honored to have them. And then yeah. over to my right, we have Mr. Dylan. Tell us, Dylan, uh, you're the worship leader. Are you the best worship leader at Life Church? I'm one of the worship leaders at Life Church. Oh, oh, but not the best? Not the best. Okay. Pastor Tony's definitely the Well, best. you was telling me that before the camera came on. But anyway, uh, anyway, we're glad to have him. Then we got Miss K.R., uh, she works at our Sparta campus as well, and it's good to have you, Miss K.R. And then we've got Bob Sotis, who's been a good friend of mine for over 30 years. And Bob is basically over all of our outreach events and helps us with senior life here at the church. But I just wanted us to have a discussion. We've already prayed. So, uh, so let me just say this before we go to Bob. I want to say this to you. If you didn't receive what you need from your earthly father, you must go to your heavenly father. You must go, and that's, I think that's what's really helped me, is he's a father that has no flaws and loves you perfectly. And so that's so important. But Bob, yes, sir, you, and I, you and I were talking, so Bob and I have known each other for uh, over 30 years now. And so I know his story quite well, but many of you know Bob here at the church, but maybe you don't know his story. But Bob, uh, let's talk about you and I have sat down and talked about these discussions, but your dad, it wasn't necessarily like my dad where there was maybe an abandonment issue or wasn't involved. You and your dad were very involved. You yes. even ran businesses together. We did. We did. Uh, we did that till I was 23 years old. Uh, that it, and let me just start in the beginning. Uh, my parents divorced when I was six, so there is a little bit of abandonment issues. But as, as we got older, as I got older, my dad needed me. Uh, I, I often, as you were talking, I thought about chattel. Uh, I became a piece of equipment to him, and he needed my help with things, so he used me in different lights. So it became very conditional in that matter. In other words, it was a performance-driven relationship. If I did good, then I was blessed. If I didn't do good, he basically didn't love me at that point, and it became very hard on me. Uh, until I got older, and then when I turned 23, we just had a massive disagreement. And honestly, even to today, my paternal father, as I would call him, doesn't talk to me. So, so, so at that moment, when, when the the some kind of business issue came up, and you didn't, you weren't able to perform in what he thought you should perform yes. in business. Yes. And so from that moment forward, he's refused to speak to you. Yes. Even I actually tried the Holy Spirit one day. I was sitting at the farm. The Holy Spirit said to call him. And I tried to call him. I think I was 50 years old. And I don't want to say what he said to me, but he basically said he didn't want to talk to me ever. And I cried like a little baby. But I believe I was released from that point. I was also blessed. I, I, and you know this story, too. When my, when my dad abandoned us as kids, I, my mom found another man who was an angel sent. I truly believe he was an angel sent. And I do want to give him a little bit of honor in that. And I, and I met his dad. I knew his dad. And uh, he was a neat, neat, yeah. neat guy. Yeah. He just passed away yeah. how long ago? Mm, uh, two years ago. But I think your dad would be okay with me saying this because he was the biggest jokester you ever met. But he was probably one of the ugliest angels then that God's ever created. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> he was a World War II veteran, and we got to bury him at Arlington. So it was really, it was really neat. And that yeah. was, I believe, he was an angel sent to my yeah. mom, who kept us alive as kids. And what happens is, as as we got older, I've been able to take from both of them. Where one of them taught me certain work ethics, the other one taught me how to be kind and compassionate and loving and committed and, and committed to what we do. And and he's been, he's always been faithful to my mom. And he's always been good to us as kids, so we never hurt for anything or anything like that. So what you're saying, Bob, is uh, it was your your relationship with your dad was all performance, not really relational. Yes. And if you perform well, yes, you're a, you're you're my boy. Yep. If not, yep, you're not my boy. That's correct. And so now let me ask you a question. I told you kind of what it d did for me. How do you think that impacted you and what has God had to work on to help you work through that? I believe in, in, when I was younger, I always thought it was about earning more money. I thought you have to earn money, you have to earn money, you have to earn money. But as I got a little older, I realized it was fear of failure. I did not want to fail. So I would try so hard to be the best at whatever it was I was doing. And really, quite honestly, it drove you crazy at some point because you cannot keep up the pace right uh, you just you just can't do it and and what you learn is how does our heavenly father treat us yeah and and that that's the most important thing that's me. good that's good well let's uh let's let's move around the table kr talk to us and i invited you specifically to this because of uh i know you and your dad had a wonderful relationship but also your dad just went home to be with the lord here recently and uh, so talk to us. Yeah, my dad and mom um, showed me a lot about being consistent, being constant. I might not have, have seen that early on, but they had me very young. Um, they worked in factories and I really just got to see parents who always showed up. My dad was my coach from the, the time that I started sports, I played three sports. He didn't miss a game. He didn't miss a practice. Even when I started middle school and high school, he picked me up from school. He dropped me off at practices. We went and did all the extra stuff together. Um, he took me out to eat before practices. So I have only ever known that. Um, I, I don't know anything different. And he even continued continued that over with my kids. Yeah. Um, both of my boys, um, he was their coach. He picked them up, honestly, my youngest, maybe five of seven nights a week to take him out to wow. eat before practices and has been his coach. And so my dad was um, so caring, so loving. He- Very involved. Very involved. And again, I don't think I probably most of my life looked back on it. We all could pick out really rough moments sure. and hard times. So I don't think forever I thought about that. I may have even thought, man, he, this is the only thing we do is sports. But now I look back and it wasn't. It was rides in the car. It was trips with our family. We really were um, a very close-knit family. So you had intimacy. I had very much intimacy. My dad was a hugger. Um, I sat on his lap. Um, we were not Italian, but we 100% maybe weird kissed each other on the mouth like I was you daddy's girl. girl. Absolutely. I loved him. And my mom says, told me the other day, she was like, I, I didn't see it for a long time, but I think you really are probably most like him. Yeah. So I'm it's glad. So, so yes. let me ask you something uh, because we tease. I mean, again, we don't want to project to anyone that everybody up here has got it all figured out. Well, that's why we're having this discussion. And so, KR, um, I sense a real confidence in you uh, ever since I've known you. Not, not that you don't have things you work through. We all do. But there's, that has to come from some, something your dad instilled in you then. And your mom. But we're just talking about dads today. Uh, but, but, I mean, him being that involved and him being that, he wasn't just your coach on a ball field. He had to be somewhat of a coach in life. And that, that, that's probably where some of the confidence has come from, don't you think? Yeah, my dad was very simple. He didn't talk a lot. If he spoke, people listened. He um, was very wise. And so I think just from an early age, um, talks in the car about just how to be kind, the kind of person we're supposed to be. But even inside sports, he would use that as a way to teach me um, the kind of person I'm gonna be, work hard. 
um, but this isn't the only part of life, you know. So for sure, he um, he was also a very confident person. Like God created us to be these people, and that's that's all we have to be. That's good. And so probably most of that come from just him being confident in who he was yeah. as, as a dad and as a person. Even though he um, is gone, God has just reminded me so often of ways that I can can stay connected here. And yeah. um, I think of him often, but I just know that he is where we're all trying to get to. Amen. And as Amen. hard as that is, I can't really be mad about that. Yeah. And I'm sure you can still see him some in your boys too, can't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. We, um, my, my boys have kept him very much alive for me and I can still hear conversations. We'll be at ball games and I can hear my dad saying, well, he shouldn't have did that and he should have did this. And so very, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we honor him today. I want you to know that. Well, Dylan, talk to us. <laughs> well, first of all, PV, thanks for having us here. Asking me here is an incredible honor to get to do this. And so um, I got to share, you had mentioned off camera a little bit, Pastor Christian mentioned uh, with our students a couple of weeks ago, just kind of my story and my background a little bit. And, and it was it was an incredible experience because I've never really shared that you know, publicly. And this is really honestly probably the second time I've gotten to do that. Um, but um, you know, something I shared with the students, I'll just kind of start at the beginning. Uh, you know, I was born uh, to a teen pregnancy, uh, you know, teen mom, older guy as a biological dad. Um, and, and very early on, he was very kind of in and out of my life. And, and eventually, just for whatever reason, never really got a reason for it, um, but just decided that, you know, being a father just wasn't really in the cards for him. And so I uh, don't have a relationship with my biological dad to this day. Um, however, uh, you know, I did have uh, a very, very good stepdad who stepped in to be, uh, you know, my dad, he's still my dad to this day. Um, not perfect, but uh, he and, and so many other people uh, just helped fill in a lot of the gaps for me that that absence and that void kind of left. Um, and and it's a huge reason of why I'm who I am today. And so, awesome. Yeah. And we, we got to say, aren't you going to have a baby? I am going to have a baby. Come on, to be a daddy. Yeah, yeah Come a on. couple of months. Yeah, my wife's due in August. So I think really you're excited. naming it Bobby. Yeah, close. Bobby, Livy, I agree. But, but close, very close. <laughs> close. Yeah. Not close at all, is it? No. I told your wife, I said, it can be I, E, or Y. So it can be Either a girl one. or boy. Yeah, right, yeah. right. We're still praying about it. Yeah, so. you know you're not. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, so let me ask this, yeah. Dylan. Uh, and I know, you know, God always will bring something or someone into our life will yeah. allow him to, to heal a hurt that might be there. Yeah. But could you just kind of like with Bob and I, could, can you maybe, and maybe you can't, but can you put your finger on, maybe some things you see in your life that maybe that impacted, uh, whether it be insecurity, yeah. whether it be anger, or, yeah. and it, what would you say? So I think for me, mostly it's a couple of things, you know, Bob mentioned like performance, right? And so for a long time, I really felt the need, uh, you know, because, you know, in my mind, you, you kind of rehearse this thing of, well, I wasn't good enough. It was a problem with me, you mm -hmm. know, for whatever reason, I just wasn't enough to make this guy stay. Um, and so into early adulthood, you know, now, even to this day, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm a three on the Enneagram and that's the achiever. And I think that's probably where a lot of that comes from. Like I want to perform and I want to appear like I have it together um, just for the purpose of being accepted. Right. Yeah. And so um, over the last couple of years, especially and now going into fatherhood, um, you know, I've really just had to let God heal a lot of that to know that, hey, just by being me, because that's how God has created me, that's how he's designed me. Um, I'm enough. And so, yeah. uh, you know, that's that's one of those things to where uh, e even going into fatherhood, uh, that was a challenge for me, too. Yeah. Uh, and just to be completely honest, my wife and I, we put off having kids for quite a while, honestly, just because I, I was uh, just in the back of my mind. I was like, hey, I, I don't want to repeat some of these same mistakes. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to put a kid through some of the things that I've had to go through. And even in the last, you know, six or so months, um, I've experienced a lot of healing of, you know, awesome. God has just shown a lot of grace. Yeah. He's shown a lot of hey, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. My grace is enough for you. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to provide everything that you need as you depend on me to be That's the awesome. father that I've called you to be. And so just lots of expectation and lots of excitement kind of going into this next season. That's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Great. Well, you're going to be yeah. a great dad. You Thanks. will. Thank you're you, going to be a great dad. Thank you, Pastor. Well, let's go to the Williams here. And uh, so I think I'll start with the senior professor. <laughs> okay. uh, but it, it is an honor to have you guys. So talk to me, Seth, about... Yeah. Uh, your childhood and everything that you've heard around the table. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you so much. That's a huge honor to be here and to be 
to be talking to people in the church. And Dad, let me also say, um, I want to honor you too for being here. I know some of our church knows this story. Um, we almost lost my dad about was it, eight years ago now. Eight years ago, yeah. Um, in his early 50s, he had quadruple bypass surgery. Uh, had three heart attacks in one night and had the widow maker as they were opening you up. Mm-hmm. Um, and the doctor said that if they hadn't been pumping blood into his heart, that he wouldn't be sitting here today. Wow. That, that God had protected him Amen. on the table. And so Amen. I'm very thankful uh, that you're here with me today. So, and, and God gave <laughs> me that opportunity to talk and say, you know, his timing is perfect. He is never late. And I get to stand up and say that Amen. because of that very, yeah. Amen. That very yeah. situation. I'm and very, very so. thankful for that. Uh, principles in our home, um, for the, the people that know me and know us, I, I think most people would say that we're consistent. Uh, and I learned that from my dad. There's, uh, there's not a lot of, you know, really great days and there's not a lot of bad days. You know, it's, hey, everything's good. We've, we, we had a good day. And um, that, that comes from knowing who we are and whose we are. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that was one of the principles that was instilled in our home um, was, you know what, if something happens to us, it's going to be all right because the Lord's going to take care of us. Um, we are always in church. You know, Joshua said, it's for me and my house will serve the Lord. That was a principle that you instilled in our house. Uh, every Sunday, there wasn't a question of, do we go to church mm-hmm. or not? It's, that's just what we did. We get up and we go to church on Sunday mornings. Wednesdays, the same way. We, we went to church. And that was a, a value that, that you and mom instilled in us. And I think that's, that's a big credit to where we are today. Um, also, having our children and our family as a priority in our home. You know, it's, it's so easy now, and it, it was when we were kids too, to, to get distracted. You know, to, to sit at the dinner table or, or after you finish dinner and watch TV and, and not really talk or communicate. And that was not the case in our home. You know, we did a lot of stuff together. We, we, we did things that were simple, like playing games or, or hanging out together, watching a ball game, or whatever. And we spent a lot of time together. And so, the, so the personal intimacy was absolutely, there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I didn't have to, to long for that. I knew it was there. Yeah, it was uh, again. It was consistent. That's what we did in our home. So was. Let me cut in here a minute, Seth. Yeah. So, was the relationship and is the relationship, whether you was thirteen, twenty three, or thirty three, yeah. that I can go talk to my dad about this, and we can really open up, have a real dialogue about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's always. And see, I, like I think. Yeah. I mean, even when I said that, I think you were kind of thinking, well, of course, but that's that's rare in a lot of homes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's usually yeah. a monologue. You need to do this. You need to do that. Make sure you get your grades done. Yeah. But if you need to talk, you need to go to mom. Yeah. And that's not the case here. No. And no. see, I I think that's what I want our fathers to hear too. Is sometimes the kids need to talk to daddy, mm-hmm. and they don't need to always be pointed to mama. Yeah. Which that's important, but. Yeah. I think it's so important for us as fathers, and I have two young children myself, to to not be so busy that our kids can't come to us. Yeah. You know, and and. Even now, I will ask my children, hey, is there anything you want to talk about? That's is good. there anything that, that you have questions about? Because I want you to come to me first. Amen. Don't go asking your friends. Yeah. Don't go asking people on social media or anything like that. Hey, if you have a question, come to me, right. come to mom, Absolutely. and we'll be happy to answer Absolutely. those questions for you. And so having that time, giving them the priority, that family time, knowing that they don't have to long for, for my love. And look for it somewhere else. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right, and my right. kids now, uh, you can see that in them. That's so good. They know. You're passing it on. Yeah, absolutely. They know they can come climb up in my lap anytime they want. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to long for that. They don't have to look for that. Uh, and that makes a huge difference. You kind of pursue home. them, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, Mick, uh, uh, where did you maybe learn how to be that intentional or that personable or that intimate? Because I think sometimes it just doesn't come natural for us fathers. So there must have been an intentionality. Maybe what motivated that? Um, my father, my, my parents are still living. And I want to honor mm-hmm. my father too. And I really appreciate the way you put it. A lot of that resonated with me about your dad. Um, my parents came to know Christ. Um, neither one was raised in a Christian home. Uh, they met in a bar that my grandmother owned and my mother worked in. She wasn't old enough to drink beer, but she could serve it. Uh, Times were different then. Yeah. All right. Served my dad, and you know they, he pretty much took her out of a difficult home. Okay. They started a home, but you know what? Somebody knocked on their door when I was four, 
invited them to church, mm. and they got to know Christ. Wow! And we got to know Christ as you know, mm-hmm. as a six-year-old. I I kneeled down and come on, you know, confessed my sins and said, you know, it's funny now to think about what what a six-year-old mind might think is yeah. terrible, mm-hmm. but man, I knew I was a sinner. Yeah, okay? absolutely. And he saved me, and it stuck. Okay. Well, <clears throat> my dad had to go off to Vietnam shortly after that and didn't really get to be surrounded by people who could mature him in his faith. He comes back, he's confused about things. He never, you know, he always allowed us to go to church, but it was never a thing for him. He couldn't sit there. So he allowed us to go to church and we grew, but I didn't have a dad that I could, you know, was intimate with. Right. Okay. So, you know, one of the things you have to say is, you know, got, God gave me my better half, you know, a, a woman that could, we could raise children together and we could be intimate and understand and love God together. So I have a Christian wife, which was the best decision I had, second best decision <laughs> after Absolutely. I made after coming to know Christ. Okay. So as, as we started raising children, there was a, um, the day my, my oldest was born, okay, and this was 1989, left her, uh, left Cindy at the uh, hospital. I get home and I get a message on the answer machine. We didn't have cell phones back then that there was something wrong with our son. And she didn't know what it was and please hurry back to the hospital, okay? So I'm on my way to the hospital saying, God, he is yours. He is a gift from you. And all I am here to do is to steward him. But he's your son. And I think that galvanized it for me from yeah. that point on that, you know, I'm there to steward, to, to steward and to mm-hmm. get the little birdie to the edge of the nest at some point, <laughs> okay, where he can go and, and be what God has designed him to be. That's and awesome. that's the way it is for, for all three of our children. That's awesome. So. And let me just say this, moms, you're absolutely the best. We, lo- <laughs> we love our moms. If it seems like you've been excluded Uh, in this conversation that was on purpose Uh, because we need to talk about dads today but you're you're fantastic uh, you moms are but I just wanted to bring out in this weekend the impact and the power of a father I know our time is short but thank every one of you for sharing Um, and uh, you're just awesome people and Dylan, we'll keep it a secret that you told us before the cameras were on that you were the best worship leader at Life Church. <laughs> we, won't, we won't let anybody know that. But Appreciate that. He didn't say that. But anyway, well, I love all of you guys. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll see you soon. Awesome. Didn't they do a good job? What a great job. I appreciate them sharing their stories with us. Good to see you. God bless you. We want to welcome all of our campuses, not just here in Cookville, Sparta, Livingston, and Baxter. We're so honored to be with you guys as well, no matter where you're tuning in from. Thank you for joining us today. And then we give a special welcome to all of our family in the correctional facilities. Can we welcome them to church? Amen. So real quick. I want every father to please stand. We want to recognize our dads today. If you're a father, will you stand? Come on, girls. God bless you, men. God bless you, men. At all of our campuses, we so honor you today. And uh, we want you to know that we have a gift for every dad on the way out of every campus in our foyer. And it's not food. Uh, because we know the kids and grandkids eat that. So uh, we just a little something to tell you. We appreciate you. And before I, I'm just going to share for a couple minutes, honestly. But before I do, I want to say to all the men at Life Church, thank you for bringing your families to church. Um, I really mean that. Thank you for bringing your families to church. Uh, I, there's a lot of churches and churches that I visit sometimes that that's not the case. Uh, there'll be a few men sprinkled in the room, but mostly it's ladies, and, and, uh, but we need men stepping up and leading their family, and, and I just honor you men at Life Church for showing up the way you do. Um, let's just look at this real quick. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 says, when I think of the greatness 
of this great plan, I fall on my knees before God the Father, from whom all fatherhood, earthly or heavenly, derives its name. So the Holy Spirit through Paul, first of all, acknowledges God the Father who is in heaven. And he said, because there's a God of God the Father in heaven, that's why we have fathers here on the earth. And I want you to know that our Father, which art in heaven, wants to influence us fathers who art on earth. And uh, that's up to us whether he can influence us or not. Now, I'm going to skip some scriptures just for time's sake, but if you want to go read Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, what you'll find there is it's the, it's the most specific, uh, detailed um, instruction on the marital covenant than anywhere in the Bible. The Bible talks about marriage from Genesis to Revelation, but the, the distinctive roles of the husband and the wife are very laid out in Ephesians chapter 5. And so Ephesians 5, we're talking about the family and marriage, but then he goes right into chapter 6, and he's still talking about the family. And he goes from the marital relationship to parent-children relationship. And let me read it to you real quick. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you, for you, and you will live a long life on the earth. My mom pointed that out a lot. So notice what he says next. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. And if you, I was going to read that in Amplified, but it just talks about tenderly raising our children as fathers. But here's what I noticed when I was reading this this week. I don't know that I've ever noticed this before. But I'm reading Ephesians 5, and I'm looking at how specific he is with the role of the husband and the role of the wife. And then he continues the marriage concept, and he goes over into chapter 6, and he starts talking about children, uh, honor your parents and the Lord, this is right. Then he starts talking about parenting, and he doesn't address the mothers. I'm like, what's that about? Because we know he's not leaving women out. Women are very much involved. It talks about the role of the woman in the marriage in Ephesians 5. And then it says to the kids in Ephesians 6, uh, children, honor your parents, which includes husband and wife, mother and father. But then when it comes to specifics about raising kids, he only addresses the fathers. And I'm like, okay, what's that about? I'm going to tell you what I felt impressed to say on this. And I know this is not the case 100%, but for the most part, you know why I think he left that up? Because for the most part, moms don't need instruction. No, no, hear me, hear me. When it comes to parenting, mothers naturally nurture the children. They naturally nurture. Matter of fact, by the time they're 35, you're trying to tell them, stop nurturing Men, you love your families. And again, I've already bragged on you for being here. But the truth is, that nurturing don't come natural for us. We, we know that we're, we're the provider and you know, we, we, we want to make sure that the house bills are paid, stuff like that. But when it comes to getting involved in the details and nurturing, it's not as natural for us. So we can be somewhat irresponsible with this part. Talking about us. We can be irresponsible. And so God understands that because he created us. He knows us. And so you always give more instruction to the irresponsible party. For example, if you, when your kids got old enough for you to leave the house, you and the spouse to leave the house and go somewhere, they're old enough to be there. You always gave more instruction to that one kid. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the one that was the most irresponsible. You know what I'm saying? You got those kids in the home that, you know, you don't have to ever tell them to study. You don't have to get on to them a lot. They're just good kids. My mom had one. You're not looking at him. But, but then there's that kid that's like your spouse's family. You know what I'm saying? You've got to say, do not burn the house down. There needs to be sheetrock on the wall when I get home. 
I think that what's, that's what God's doing here is, hey, dads, I need to talk to you specifically about what you need to do. And in Colossians 3, we see the same pattern. Colossians 3, he talks about the role of the husband, the role of the wife, the role of the kids, and then the role of parenting. Let me show it to you. Colossians 3, 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, never talks to the mothers. Fathers, notice what he says, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Dad, our involvement will either bring courage or take courage out of our kids. That word in the Greek, discouraged, means to become disheartened or to lose spirit. And he says, hey, dads, make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, in the Webster's Dictionary, discouraged means to deprive of courage or confidence. A person's confidence in life often goes back to what happened with the father. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. So he says here, fear is bondage. And then he's going to get an antidote for fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So what's he saying here? This is saying the presence of a father produces courage and confidence in the child. Likewise, opposite, the absence of a father will produce insecurity and fear and make the child vulnerable. So let me talk to you about me and my dad a moment. I honor my daddy. My daddy's been in heaven for 21 years now. My daddy preached the gospel for 40 years. There's people in heaven today and will go to heaven because my dad was obedient to preach Jesus Christ. But to be totally transparent, I had no real intimate relationship with my father ever. Ever. Um, it confused me for years, especially when I got older, the fact that my dad would talk about Jesus publicly, but I can't remember him ever talking to me personally about Jesus. And I thought, why, why was that? I know my dad loved me. Why was that? You know what it was? My dad was unable to get vulnerable, and he was unable to get intimate, both of which I needed. See, I can stand up here and talk to you about Jesus publicly, but personally, especially to somebody in my family, that requires more vulnerability. Does that make sense, everybody? So my dad couldn't do that. Listen, it's not a victim statement because I'm going to give you the rest of the story, but I never heard my dad my whole life say, I love you, ever. When I was 35, when my dad passed away, he never said it. First time I ever heard a man say, I love you to me, freaked me out. I'm serious. It was a college student on the Tennessee Tech campus. He was at my, I was doing college ministry, and he and I were talking. He was a sharp young man. He's pastoring today down in uh, Alabama. But he was an engineering student, very, just very well character young man. Well, we're talking. He's about to leave. And he said, all right. He said, I got to go. I love you, Pastor Bob. And I was like, you have a good day, bud. I didn't know how to respond to that. Now I do. You know, saying I love you to people won't break your jaw. It won't break your jaw. But I didn't know how to do that because I'd never heard my dad say that. I never even heard daddy say I love you to my mother. I never saw him hold her hand. I wondered how I got here, honestly. <laughs> but now let me share something with you about my dad. My dad struggled with intimacy and vulnerability because of his horrific child abuse as a child. I never met his father. He was passed away way before I came along. But I found out, I knew he was abused, but I didn't know how bad until my aunt, his sister, came to move in with my mother. My mother took care of her till she died. And she began to talk about their childhood, and she began to reveal things that my dad went through that was absolutely horrific. She told uh, us that when daddy was five years old, that he would have to sleep out in the woods all night by himself so his drunk daddy wouldn't beat him. Could you imagine a five-year-old being out in the woods all night by itself? And then one time he was actually trying to kill my dad. When he got older, he was trying to kill him, and they had to call the sheriff. 
I can give my dad some grace. You know what I'm saying, guys? For him to have been married to my mother for 51 years, never leaving the home, being there, I understand now maybe why. See, you can't ask somebody to give something they've never received. My dad didn't know how to give affection. He never received it. And it's kind of like this. If, if, if I ask my brother here on the front row, hey, I need $100. And he reaches in his pocket and he goes, oh, Pastor Bob, all I got is 10. How can I get angry at him for not giving me something he don't have? And so a lot of people are angry at their father. Sometimes you just got to go back. What did they come up in? What, what did they not get? And, and hear me let, me, let me finish this. So I realize now, I believe one of the reasons that I got involved in drugs is because I was looking for approval. I was looking for acceptance. See, because my dad couldn't get vulnerable with me, it made me vulnerable to others. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But my dad wasn't open because he was broken, not because he didn't love us. So if that's you, here's what I want to tell you worked for me. So I, I went into a drug treatment center, but it was much more than drugs that God did in my life. Did he set me free from drugs? Yes. But you know what happened? Paul the apostle said this, that which I received from the Lord deliver I unto thee. I was able during those 14 months to receive from my heavenly father what I never received from my earthly father. Listen to me. And Paul said, what I received from the Lord deliver unto thee. And because I received it from my heavenly father, I was able to pass it on to my earthly children. And I was able to be for my children what my dad wasn't able to be for me. What do I mean? They hear, not just from their mama, they hear from their daddy, hey, I love you, buddy. I love you, girl. And they're 28 and 24. And because they needed to hear that, does that make sense, everybody? My dad, we, he never came to one ball game when I played ball. We never, we never threw ball in the yard. I did all of those with Chris. Why? Because I received from my heavenly father, therefore I could deliver it unto thee. So when a dad uh, is not present, it caused the children to be discouraged. But if a dad is present, the child is encouraged and they will live encouraged. So the question I'm asking all services and all dads, again, I'm bragging on you. Thank you for being here. But here's the question. Dad, what do you encourage your children in? Because it says fathers are supposed to bring courage. And that happens through encourage. So what do you, and listen, I know it's probably grades. And that's a good thing. We should encourage them to study hard and get good grades. Sports, you know, you encourage them in sports. And I start to say it's important, but sports really isn't that important. I know that's like blasphemy to some of you. <laughs> but sports is not the God we've made it out to be. And I like sports. I was watching Tennessee baseball Friday night until about the fourth inning, and I'm like, I'm not watching this no more. I got to preach this weekend. I'm depressed. Then I woke up the next morning, and we won 12 to 11. Woo, glory to God. <laughs> but, but the question is, do you encourage them in the Lord? The Bible says to encourage them in the Lord. What does that look like? Have a God discussion every once in a while. You don't have to get your Bible out and do Bible studies, but just, hey, just want you to know, maybe I hadn't said this to you in a while, God's important to your dad. God's important to me. He's brought me through a lot. They need to hear say that. See, we understand this. What we invest in, we get a return on. Are we investing in them spiritually? Ephesians chapter four, 6 verse 4 says, fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Notice here he said, don't point your finger, take them by the hand. See? See, if we're not careful, we'll just give instruction. Don't go there, don't do this, don't hang out with him, don't do that, study hard. And those things are important, but he says, here, take them by the hand, not just point out what they shouldn't do. It reminds me, I used to take Chris to Atlanta Braves ball games. Every, started when he was about three or four. We still go today after he's married. It was the dad's son time. And we would drive down there, get us a hotel, we'd go to the game, come back, have our snacks, 
lay back and eat snacks and mama ain't doing nothing, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, but you know what? He still loves those times. But I can remember when we'd go through the Turner Field. Now it's not in Turner Field, but we'd be walking around the ballpark. You know, I look back now and I didn't go, now Chris, don't go over there. And don't go under those staircases over there. And don't do No, I didn't point out where he should and shouldn't go. I held his hand and just walked through it with the stadium through it. You know what? We should still hold their hand. Even after their we hold their hand through life and they can come talk to us about things that, that that's heavy on their heart. And mom is vitally important, but dad, you need to be able to talk too. I know that sounds like what? Talk? No, seriously. You need to be able to talk. You need to be able to share your heart and hear their heart. Our kids will go where we go. They don't just follow where we point. That's why in Mark chapter 3, verse 14, when Jesus called his disciples to himself, it says the first thing he called them to do was to be with him. Notice he didn't say, get your scrolls out and take this down because I got some instruction. No, he he. He was willing to be with them, if you will, take them by the hand for three years and to show them how to live a godly life on earth. That's our assignment too. Throughout the Gospels, you'll see that, well, matter of fact, throughout the Bible, God has many titles. He's a creator. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. So you could say God's an architect. He's an engineer. He's a physician. But you know what he elevated above all those titles? Father. Jesus always referred to him as Father. Matter of fact, Mark chapter 1, verse 9, only one day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized in the Jordan River. As Jesus came out from the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice, this is the Father, from heaven said, you are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. This is what he said to Jesus. You're my Son, and you bring me great joy. Do you understand that's before Jesus did any earthly ministry? He had not performed one miracle, which tells me the father and son relationship was not based on performance. It was based on position. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't live for approval. He lived in approval because of his father. If a kid doesn't feel approved, they'll live the rest of their lives trying to approve. If a kid doesn't feel approved, They'll spend the rest of their lives trying to prove, primarily from their father. And I could, listen, I've had 50-year-olds and 60-year-olds in my office over the 30 years of ministry, some of them very, very wealthy, very wealthy. And they would sit in my office and would just depression and and inability to, to move forward in life. And when we would dig down and expose the root, Come back to daddy nearly every time. So let me end with this. I want to show you the example of the long-term effects of an absent father. So we won't ever be. And that example is Ishmael. Abraham and Sarah, it's a real quick story. So Abraham and Sarah, God wants to have a son through Abraham and Sarah. And they're having to wait. 20, 10 years, 20 years, 25. And so Sarah finally said, this ain't never going to happen. So you see my servant girl, Hagar over there, Abe, go over and sleep with her and get us a boy. (laughs) That'd make a reality show, wouldn't it? (laughs) Bad mistake. Bad mistake. So Abraham and Hagar get together. They have this son named Ishmael. And then a few years later, here comes Isaac through Abraham and Sarah the child that they were supposed to have waited on. What happens is, after Isaac is born, Sarah and Hagar begin to have real issues with each other. And so Sarah finally says, send her and the boy away. Abandon them. Now, here's the interesting part. God told Abraham, do what Sarah says. Now, why would God do that? Because God's wise, and he knew that they, were, they would never be compatible, and somebody was going to kill each other. So he said, this is not going to work. So Abraham does it. Now, let me show you. Ishmael's abandoned. Watch this. 
Genesis 21, 14. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and container of water, strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. So Ishmael here has been abandoned by his father. However, he was never abandoned by the father God. Let me show you. Genesis 21, 14. This is Hagar talking. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. Who heard him? God. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him. Notice what God says. For I will make a great nation from his descendants. He says he may have been abandoned by his earthly father, but his heavenly father is still here, and I want to bless him. But here's the problem. Lean in. Here's the problem. Although God blessed Ishmael, Abraham's rejection caused an infection in that boy. And it's still going on to this day. Because that's why so many can't connect with God the Father today because they can't get past what they experienced with their earthly father here. It's a big issue. So because of Abraham's rejection, Ishmael has an affection. And listen, you know what happens? Ishmael became very angry, and his descendants still are to this day. The wars in the Middle East go back to this story right here. How could a group named Hamas go in and cut the heads off women and rape them in front of their families and put their children in ovens and cook them? How could that happen? This story right here. This story right here. Let me prove it to you. Genesis 16, 11. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant, and I will give, you will give birth to a son. He's talking to Hagar. You are to name, his, name him Ishmael, which means God hears. So we know God heard him crying. For the Lord has heard the cries of your distress. This son of yours, listen to this. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. That's why you've got going on, and there'll never be peace in the Middle East until the Prince of Peace comes back. It goes back to this story right here. Fathers, this makes it apparent. It matters how we parent. It absolutely has long-term effects. Because Ishmael was rejected, he became infected with hate and anger. That's why Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline instruction that comes from the Lord. In the message, it says, Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. So, Dad, be a man. Take them by the hand and show them the way. So, I'm done, but let's just get to the truth as I land this plane. You know, the truth will set you free, but it, always, it don't always make you feel good. Do you know James chapter 1 calls the Word of God a mirror? You know something I figured out about a mirror? It'll never lie to you. You know what I'm saying? Older I get, I look in the mirror, and I'm like, that's the ugliest mirror I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it ain't the mirror, baby. It is not the mirror. The mirror don't change. Well, the mirror of God's word addresses the fathers because he knows we need extra help in this area. Not because we don't love. It's sometimes we don't know how to express it or show it. And here's what, here's what we struggle with, dads, talking to me too. It's what my dad struggled with. We hate vulnerability. Men hate vulnerability. Because we see vulnerability as weakness. I think it's just the opposite. I think if we can't get vulnerable, that's a sign of weakness. Are you listening to me? Can I, can I love on you real hard just a minute? And I'm just talking about, talk about, talk, talking about you. I believe this is a ploy of the enemy, but it doesn't matter if it's at Life Church or any church I go preach at. One of the, one of the signs of how it's hard for us men to get vulnerable is during worship time. It's during worship time. What do I mean? It's crazy. It doesn't matter what church I go preach at. It's like the women throw their hands in the air like they just don't care. <laughs> and standing beside her. 
That's funny, but it's not. Because you know what this is? That's pride. That's pride. I ain't going to look like her. How about looking like him? Seriously. It's pride. It's, it's, here, I'm not scolding you. It's we hate vulnerability. You know, you know, the Bible tells us to raise up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You know what raising up hands is about? It's about submitting to his authority. I had practice before I went to Teen Challenge. I'd get out of my car and go. Because <laughs> somebody was there to make sure I had a ride. But you know what this was? I'm submitting to authority. Hey, men, there's an authority that we need to submit to. He's bigger and badder than all of us put together. You know another thing of why I raise my hands? The same reason, the same reason my little grandbaby, Luke, comes up to me now at 19 months old, 18 months old, and he comes up and he does this right here. What's he saying? Pick me up. You know what, Dad? Maybe you need a pickup. Maybe I need a pickup. But I know. I, I, I get it. It's hard. But I'm telling you, there's freedom on the other side of pushing through that. Your kids need to hear you talk about God. And it don't have to be deep. We're going to go through Romans chapter 8 tonight. You can just say, hey, you know, something like this. Hey, guess what God did for me at work this week? Or, hey, buddy, I don't think I've ever talked to you about this. But you know who your dad was before he met Jesus? I mean, those kind of things matter. Jake is great. Pastor Jake, our children's pastor, he's, I mean, our kids, will you hear him say, Jake is great, Jake is great, Jake is great. But he's not you. He's not you. You're the idol that they're looking up to. They need to hear you say, you know what? Maybe I've never talked to you about this, but God's important. I want you to know God's important. School's important, sports, but God's important. They need to hear you say that. And, and, and if, it's, if it's vulnerable at first, You'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. But again, let me, let me say this. We see vulnerability as weakness, but it's not. The other day I was having a conversation with a gentleman. We were talking about this kind of subject. And I said, when you think of power, when you think of the word power, I said, what image goes through your mind? You shut your eyes, you think of the word power. What do you image? What, what do you imagine? I said, is it a tank? Is it, is it a, a F-16 or, or some fighter jet? Is it Arnold Schwarzenegger or Rich Froning or Bobby Davis with his shirt off? Or, <laughs> he was like, you lost me there. But no, I said, really, what is it that you imagine? And I forgot what he said, and I said, you know what I think is the strongest image, the most powerful image that's ever been demonstrated? I said, when I shut my eyes and I see a beaten, bloody, naked man hanging on a cross. See, the world thought that was weak. Look at him, up there naked and exposed in front of everybody, nailed to a tree. And he, Do you understand all Jesus would have done was went, Dad, phew, billions of angels would wipe everybody out. But why did he... Why was Jesus willing to get vulnerable? Because of you and me. He was willing to get vulnerable because you and I needed his vulnerability. I'm saying to us men, if we're not willing to get vulnerable with our children, they will get vulnerable with somebody else. A bunch of these crazy people on the internet. Are you listening to me? So, God believes in you. I believe in you. Now you just got to believe in you. Amen? Let me pray. Father, thank you. I do thank you for all the men at Life Church. It's so refreshing, not just to me, but I know you love to see men taking their families to church. So I pray on this special day, Lord, they'll just sense that from you, that you're honored that they would take their families to spiritual worship. Lord, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice <clears throat> that does not know you, God the Father, may they do that this Father's Day. Head bowed and eyes closed. It's Father's Day. 
what a great day to make sure God is your father. And if you're not sure of that, no matter where you're at and you're listening to us, but you say, you know what? I don't know the father. I have no relationship with him. Here's how you get it. Jesus said, you come to the father through me. So if you're not where you need to be with Jesus, we can just pray and make that happen right now. So if you don't know where you're at with the Father, would you just right there where you're at, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but if you just raise your hand to Father and say, that's me, I'm ready, Father. Would you just slip your hand up? Amen. 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 If you're online, I want you to pray this with us. But everybody pray this. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. And I believe God raised you from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your blood. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my King, my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate with you. We celebrate with you.